Hey guys, welcome back to another edition of The Detour Live. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Dan Jones, joined by four-time national road champion from Australia, Johnny Trevorrow. Now, we were going to be going live on Tuesday night, but as we do on The Detour, we've changed it to Monday uh, because we have got a very special guest to kick things on, Ify, who's currently leading the Santos Festival of Cycling women's event with one stage to go, and that is, of course, introduction, John Ruby Roseman Gannon, the Australian Criterium Champion. I thought you might have been about to be Australian Road Champion as well, but it uh, didn't quite happen that way. But And uh, winner of Lex the Blackburn Bay Crits. There it is. <laughs> Ruby, that's exactly why we got you on. Don't worry about the Sandos Festival of Cycling. You won the Bay Crits. That must be feel as good as winning a gold medal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I actually have done it a number of years in a row and to finally win it was pretty cool actually um but would also like to win this tour now as well well you're in a very good position leading with one stage to go and i think if you said you got an eight second lead how confident are you going into the final stage yeah i'm pretty confident i think um one of my fortes is consistency so Got, got some confidence in the legs and I've got an amazing team behind me. Like having Amanda Spratt riding for you is like crazy, I think. Like I, I'm still kind of pinching myself about that. Um, but also in Georgia Baker and Alex Manley, who are both very good track riders and on the road, um, and Amber Pate, who came second in the TT. So, yeah, they've been uh, smashing themselves all week for me and hopefully we can finish it off tomorrow. Now you mentioned uh, Amanda Spratt. Now, of course, Spratty's uh, come back from you know some uh, operations and uh, to get herself right, and we can see that she's you know nowhere near her, her, her brilliant best. And she struggled so much yesterday. She seemed a lot better today. Yeah, she actually. I think she has picked up today because she was on the front for a few k's, and um, everyone was hurting on her wheel, and I was like. Geez, everyone is lucky Spratty's not on her best form because that would be burning some serious <laughs> It must be good just to have Spratty back in the bunch. We had her on the show a couple of months ago just before her surgery, and it is such a, a big surgery, but just to be back racing must be huge for her. Yeah, I think so. I think she loves it and loves riding her bike, so I think she's very happy. And also for me, I find it super relaxing having a rider like her around because just takes the pressure off a bit when you've got someone with that much experience, like making decisions and checking if you're okay and everything. So we're so lucky to have her back. Now, one thing I did notice is you guys rode over the gravel today. And of course, Nathan Haas was straight away on Twitter. You know, he wants to see more of it. How was that experience? Yeah, I liked it. And there was a bit of a pinch in that gravel that actually split the group. And I was like, if this kept going, I think like we'd actually have a serious split. So yeah, I really like that bit of gravel. To be fair, it wasn't the harshest gravel I've ever ridden on, but um, it was cool. Yeah, and it was sort of a lead into the to the major climb of the of the stage too. So it really put a bit of uh, uh, extra pressure on everybody. Yeah, definitely. I think I honestly think it was harder than the actual QOM. Um, yeah, we were going pretty fast into it, and then it was a pretty uh, pretty steep little gravel bit there. So. But, yeah, the quam was also pretty close to it. So I'm surprised it actually didn't split more. Now, we have got the stage preview, if you, of stage number three, because we had Stewie on oh, a couple of months ago now. Uh, what's your synopsis of tomorrow's uh, epic stage? You're talking me or are you talking to Ruby? Oh, anyone who wants to chime in. <laughs> I should have I should have led with it. <laughs> well, I think it's a, it looks a great stage. I, I I'm actually flying in the morning, so hopefully I can get there just before the start and, 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 and jump in the car behind you. But um if not, uh look, it, it's not uh like a the men with a Wollonga Hill finish. It's a solid uh, stage, and I think as Ruby mentioned, she's got a very strong team. But, you know, there's nothing in this. I mean, Ruby, you've got really good form, but you haven't won the stage yet. You got rolled in, uh, on, on day one with, uh, with Emily Watts. And then uh, um, Mauve Kluff, we'll get that right. Yeah. yeah, Nothing like coming on the detour to kill your confidence. That's what people <laughs> love about this show. You, you've come in confident going into stage three. And if he's gone, hang on, 
it's but, not over yet. I'm just saying it's not over. It's it's great that you're coming with the team, but I mean, look at the team. You lead by eight seconds, uh, thirteen seconds to Emily, then Nicole Frain, our new Australian road champion, mm. at seventeen seconds. Jilda Reynolds, who's in great form, at twenty three, and then all the rest of the field virtually at twenty three seconds. So can't let anyone get away. So it's going to be a wonderful last stage. Yeah, I think we're definitely going to fight for it. Um, it will definitely be a challenge. And, yeah, I mean, I would have loved to get up for the stage. I was really hungry for today, but just wasn't to be. And realistically, yeah, a lot of the time it doesn't work out perfectly, but it's still been a good two days. And, yeah, I'm pretty pretty hungry for tomorrow. So uh, I think I think with, between us, we've got a really strong team. We've got to cover everything. We're going to have our hands full. But um, I like a bit of chaos as well. So I think, yeah, I'm pretty <laughs> confident. Um and excited for the race. Well, Ruby, we wish you all the best. We'll be cheering for you uh, tomorrow. And, uh, yeah, congratulations on some awesome form this year. As John said, you know, national criterion champion, your winner of the Bay Crits, and hopefully you can get the chocolates uh, at the Sandos Festival of Cycling. Yeah, and I'd just like to add Thank to you. that. And congrats, congratulations on making it to the World Tour. It was something we all knew, knew was going to happen. It's great to see you sign, of course, with uh, Bike Exchange uh, Jayco, um, and um, yeah, looking forward to uh, an exciting uh, year and the right at the point in in the big time. So well done. Thank you, and thanks so much for having me on. No, nah, not a problem at all. Thanks, Ruby. All the best. See ya. See ya. Ruby Roseman Gannon, absolute star, and as we said, we hope she can get the chocolates tomorrow. Now we've got a jam pack lineup. Iffy, straight into a couple of uh, Aussie cycling legends, of course, Matt Wilson and Olympic gold medalist Scott McGorry. Uh, start with you, Matty. Uh, how are you travelling now? You're on the other side of the fence in team management because of the ARA Pro Racing Sunshine Coast, and uh, you're at the obviously the women's event there at Adelaide. How's it all going? Mate, it's going great. Yeah, fantastic. I uh, can't complain at all. So we got the stage win today with with, with Maeve Plouf, um, which was an awesome ride. Uh, so, yeah, we're in a good position. Second overall now going into the final stage tomorrow. Mate, you had some fantastic results at the Nationals as well. It, it really is a, a premier development team for riders, particularly if they've got ambition to go on to, to World Tour. Is that w what your ambitions were when you originally set up the, the whole program? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the core the, the core mission objective, I guess, is, is is to develop riders to go into that next tier of cycling. But I guess where we were always wanted to be different was uh, that we, we weren't all about that. We wanted to really give guys an opportunity to um, get an education as well and, and sort of keep their feet on the ground, um, be, be working or, or doing something else, uh, not just riding your bike, because the, the reality of the sport is that uh, most of the riders that come through won't make a career out of cycling. So we didn't want them to be at 24, 25 years old without an education or any idea what they're going to do for the rest of their lives. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of collateral damage come through uh, development programs in that way. And, and we saw it as an opportunity to create something a little bit different and, and uh, yeah, give guys an opportunity of both sides of the fence. And Scooter, welcome back to the detour again, mate. How's it feel to be back over in Radelaide and some good track racing? To kick things off the other night well good track rider in um, may ploof picking up the stage today as well so yeah friday night was was good to get back in the commentary box with anna Mears. um you know i think we worked really well together at the olympic games so we were happy to to be back doing that again so it was good to see the the track racing and then i've been on obviously the the women's tour for the first two stages and, and actually a question to you matt because mave was um, you know, she was doing seated sprints today. So she'd gone early, maybe a tad too early in, in a couple of the sprints, including the finish, but then had to sit down and had that power, what I call sustainable power, to still keep accelerating while seated, which, you know, we know it's unusual in, in road races, in road, road sprints. Um, do you feel that there's the track background, the power from the team pursuit, the weightlifting, everything they have to do on the track, is that why she was able to do what she did today? That's one question. The other one... Why couldn't she do it yesterday? Did she just need, you know, some racing in her legs? Because she hasn't had much road racing, has she? No, she hasn't. And she actually um, had COVID uh, not too long ago. She was a last-minute starter back at the Nationals. Didn't even think she'd be there. 
Uh, luckily, she was asymptomatic, so she she didn't didn't really knock her around very much. But she certainly hasn't had the the preparation that she would want. In terms of what what happened yesterday, I think maybe she just needed a little bit of confidence, and she's found that confidence in the finish, and she just came out swinging today. Um, in terms of the why she can do what she does, I'll leave that to the coaches and, and God, I don't know. <laughs> but she, um, what she did in that first spring, I think, yeah, I, yeah she went way too early. Um, but I don't, I don't know if you saw, but the 500 metres before that, she was in the wind as well, just sort of sitting there. So she's clearly, she's clearly got some horsepower um, and she just got better as the stage went on. Hmm. Hmm. What, what's yeah. the uh, crowds been like on the ground, Scooter? Uh, well, a little bit yeah, down, obviously, on um, the normal tour down under, but also probably a little bit down on last year because South Australia, it hasn't been that long that they've opened up. And, um, you know, it's, they're, people are nervous. You can even just tell through the CBD, you know, just walking around sort of Friday, Saturday, there were not many people around. It was it was really quiet. So I think everyone's just a little bit nervous. I know okay. that... Uh, sorry, mate. I was going to say, looking at the TV, it looked like it wasn't a bad crowd. Yeah, you know, it's still okay, but just just a bit down on on you know I think what we had even last year. So I'm not trying to say it was you know terrible crowds, but I just know there's a general feeling in South Australia everyone's just a little bit nervous about you know how everything's opened up. Um, so therefore, fantastic to see the crowds that we are seeing. Um, and then yesterday, remember yesterday it, 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 they've had torrential rain yesterday. You know, there were mm. roads in the north of uh, northern uh, South Australia that have actually been blocked off or washed away. Um, and there was still plenty of brave people that rode out to the stage and then rode back in torrential rain. So there's some hardcore fans in South Australia that are still desperate to get out and watch bike racing, which is a really good thing to see. Is, is the overriding feeling being like adding more events to give this whole festival browning? When it does go back to World Tour, they're going to stick with it because it has been such a popular formula, Scooter? Yeah, that's look, talking to Stewie O'Grady about all that, um, obviously having the NRS race here, um, when the World Tour comes back, the budget with them will increase as well. You know, the, the budget is much, much less for this event through South Australian government than it is for the World Tour. So that'll go back up again. And as long as they can manipulate it with the government and how much money and the sponsors, et cetera, Stu is really keen to keep the NRS element to it. So the women's race will go back to being perhaps, you know, World Tour level. Um, but for the NRS, there's a question, you know, so what will they have? And he's really keen to continue that on. Um, so you can imagine what that would be like for all the National Road Series teams to be involved in this when it does go back to World Tour level. Of course, they're not going to race in the World Tour race. They'll have a separate race um, before the, the Tour Down Under starts. But then that just adds to the the vibe you know, of, of the race itself and the legacy that it will then continue to have for the next level of riders coming through. You know, And those kids that go into the NRS, they'll be inspired because they'll be here racing you know, almost nearby. Uh, the World Tour guys, um, and it just makes sense to have all these other events that have come in. So that, that's the opportunity that has come from the pandemic for this event. I think we'll see that really grow in the next few years. Ify, I was just going to ask, Maddie, um, were you in the in the race car today for for on the stage? I was, and I think it was the first time ever I've been in a race car for a women's race. So it was it was great. Exactly what I was going to ask. So yeah, so your impressions of of the difference of jumping in the race car um, behind the, the the women's race and the men's race. Yeah, look, it's 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 very different. It's a very different style. Um, we've brought in Lucy Kennedy as a as a women sports director um, this year, which is great. So she's she's I think it was only her third day ever behind the wheel as well. So. Um, but yeah, look, it's, it's definitely a different style. Um, it takes a takes bit of getting used to, but it's, it's great to see. Was the highlight, talk about experiences in the car, was the best experience you ever had in the car that week we had at California? I think, was it 2013? <laughs> was that when you look back at your time in the in the team car? I do look fondly at that, although I, I was I was I was race weight. I reckon the first four years of my retirement until I got to that tour, and I put on two or three kilos with you in the car yeah. with, American, with American junk food, and I've never never really got it off. Do they do they give you a lunch packet to it down under? No, no. We do, we we do staff do. <laughs> uh, yeah. What do you get in the lunch pack? Do you get samples of the region or? Um, I haven't actually had one yet. I just I asked the question on the way back from the stage today because I was starving. And they said, yeah, yeah, they're lunch packs. You pick them up at the finish. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'll get uh, one tomorrow. So I'll have a look tomorrow. I'll let you know. 
Well, buddy. Yeah, mate. I don't, I'm just, sorry, i got to throw it in there. I remember that California, every time I opened a, a glove box or a side panel or a rooftop thing, lollies would just fall out and hit me on the head. <laughs> you'd, you'd stash them in every corner of the car. <laughs> oh, mate, that was the best thing about America. Is like every little region you'd go to, there'd be like a lolly shop. And you could just get, I think we've got those popcorn. Remember you told me about, oh, they got the best popcorn. It's like sweet and salty. I'm like, what? We didn't, we didn't have that in Australia at the time. Yeah, and then we yeah. just got bags of it and railed it. And then that mechanic nicked it. And uh, I think he got the lemon and sass at the end of the year. <laughs> but but uh, I was going to say, within your, within your group, uh, Maddie, you know, given that you know, this is the last year before it probably goes back to World Tour next year, there must be a big buzz, particularly among the younger riders, to go, this is a, such a huge opportunity with, with national TV coverage to really make it count. Because if you do show form this is the best opportunity for world tour teams to see what you can do. Yeah. And look, I was, I was so happy to hear Scott say that, um, that they're thinking about investing in uh, this race and the NRS for the future, because it has been a huge opportunity for these young riders, especially when you consider the fact that the whole season last pretty much the last two years have been wiped out due to COVID, but they've had this, this to look forward to. And, um, it has been a, a, just a massive thing for them and to continue that legacy, um, I think will show, It'll show fruit in the future for, for Australian cycling, um, having this on the calendar at that level. Well, you're running your own NRS events yourself now. You launched one, uh, was it in December last year, November? Um, do, you re- yep. do you reckon this will have a spillover effect into other events for the NRS in terms of trying to get sponsors and you know TV, all that sort of stuff? It, it all helps, doesn't it? So Australian cycling needs events and needs people to watch events and needs people to understand the teams and understand the riders and get invested in them. And and the more events that there are and the better quality events like this with television and, and all that sort of stuff. And it, it, it all just creates an asset that people want to get attached to. And, you know, then we get it on TV more often and all of a sudden we've got bigger sponsors and, and a bigger sport in Australia. So, yeah, absolutely. Scooter. Um, Matt's absolutely spot on there. So one of the things that I'm sort of witnessing is with the growth of the Tour de France, um, it has actually hurt some of the smaller events and also some of the smaller teams. You know, I know in Europe, you know, so if you go to Germany and, um, you know, even some of the other countries, France, some of the smaller races, tours have disappeared because they, they don't get the same sort of recognition as the Tour de France. Um, and it's almost the same here as well. So our Aussie cycling fans, because it's the tour and, and the classics are so accessible to watch, a lot of Aussie cycling fans aren't interested in watching the domestic racing and the National Road Series. You know, and we have half-hour shows uh, for every uh, National Road Series race, including the Sunshine Coast one that, uh, that Matt put on and the crew. But the audience isn't that big. So if we could get the Australian domestic um, sports fans, not just cycling, but sports fans as well, to actually partake in the coverage, watch it, you know, be enthusiastic about it and enjoy this next block of incredible talent that's coming through, it's only going to make the sport grow. And then then it'll actually give them more to see. They'll get more recognition and they'll have riders that they've, they've met through watching the National Road Series that have gone into the World Tour that they'll have this much stronger connection with when they're watching them at the Tour de France or in the women's races as well overseas. So... Um, we just need to be a little bit more patriotic and, and I think support our domestic scene and get on board. If he, yeah. Yeah, look, you're both spot on. And, and one of the secrets to all of this is television. And that's where I'm a big fan of SBS. I know Channel 7 are covering this one with their streaming uh, uh, through, through 7 Plus. So, you know, jump on board and watch it. But SBS is such a great supporter of grassroots cycling in Australia. Uh, I know they've been copping a bit of a whack of late because of some changes in direction. But overall, that we, as Matty Wilson will attest to, we need the events to be covered. And no one's got the budgets to cover them like we would, you know, like they can with the Tour Down Under, whatever. But we've got Tour of Giftland coming up in a couple of weeks, Warney, uh, SBS are covering all of those with, the, with their streaming. And... We just need the fans to jump on and make sure they do uh, uh, watch it because um, that's the future for all of us. We've got to be able to give something back to the, the sponsors. It's fantastic to have the sponsors we're, we're, we're getting, but you've got to be able to deliver something for them. So uh, SBS is uh, crucial to all of that. Well, we've seen what effect that the special Ks have had on tennis. That's Kyrgios and Kokonakis. You know, they're flamboyant. <laughs> Maybe you could have that as part of your program, Matty. 
you know, get one or two just rough nuts to shake the apple tree just to get a bit of exposure, maybe stage something just to get a viral video going. Is is that part of the pro the system? <laughs> Brownie, bring back Brownie bring and, back Brown. and Robbie, Robbie McEwen. They, yeah. they had a they got a, 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 a belt up in the in the Bay Crits years ago. It was yeah. the best thing that ever happened to our ratings. And Scooter and oh. Brownie, there was a belt up there. Scooter, Scooter was involved. Every, in everyone, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave that one out. But anyway, bring back the beef. <laughs> oh, it's, it's like they would crash the bus under the gantry at the Tour de France. It's That's like right. The green edge ever got. That's <laughs> right. No, Maybe well, for one of your events. Are, are you angling for a job, Jonesy? You'd be just the guy to orchestrate um, okay. social media like that. All right, let's talk off air. Let's stage something. <laughs> and you won't know when it's happening, but something big is going to happen on the NRS this year, I can guarantee. Make sure you watch. Make sure you yeah. watch. Yeah. Jeez. Now, Matty, I know you've got to nick off to a meeting uh, very shortly. If you got anything to fire in or Scooter before we let Matty go? No, I'm, I'm looking forward to catching uh, you tomorrow, Matty. Uh, I'll be a thumb out trying to get a, get a, a, a ride in the car for, for a lap or so. But, um, yeah, so uh, look. I'm excited that uh, the ACA, uh, what you've done, Matty, is brilliant, really. I mean, you you, you were uh, DSing with one of the big teams in the world with, with uh, Green Edge, you know, Bike Exchange, and you've come back and set up this wonderful setup, uh, uh, the ACA, uh, with the Sunshine Coast. And it's just, yeah, chapeau to you, mate. The hat's off. It's been a, a, a brilliant job. And you're doing it so professionally with some really good people around you, Hank. Hank Vogels and uh, uh, Betty Kirsten, you know, really good people. So, uh, and now Lucy with, with, with the ladies, and uh, yeah, hats off, mate. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, mate. Um, hey, well, the end of end of season barbecue with those lads would be a cracker too, wouldn't it? Hey, um, Matt, the uh, so we may have got the stage win today. So great result from her, and obviously, you know, she wants to go to so, uh, track Olympics and stuff, and perhaps there's gold medals in the future, and or even Com Games this year. But hey, on the dirt today, you had Danny D. Francesco, new signing and fairly new to the sport, coming across from triathlon, and she was in the mix. She was hurting some legs going through, you know, the dirt section today through the climb. So you must be pretty yep. happy with how promising she is. Oh, absolutely. We've got a few amazing stories in there, like a couple of triathletes, a mountain biker, um, all very inexperienced. And Danny's story, I mean, she's she's 29. She's she come from triathlon. She's actually only been racing full-time on the road without any triathlon training and concentrating on it about six weeks now. Um, <laughs> so she's, she's a, just an amazing talent. And, you know, although she's a bit inexperienced, she's actually ha handles herself pretty well in the bunch for someone who's so raw. Um, yeah, and she's just mixing it with the best. So she's a really exciting rider. How do you find these talent, this talent, Matty? Do they come to you or...? Oh, it's, it's like if you said, there's a lot of good people around us and everyone's sort of in the same, in the same space and looking for talent and, um, yeah, just uh, unfolds. Oh, well, as if you said, you're doing a great job, mate. We appreciate you coming on the detour and load up some snacks for the final day in the team car, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Take Thanks, it easy, guys. mate. See you, Matty. Bye, mate. See you, See you. Bye. Bye. All right, that part of the show, we'll have a quick drinks break and we'll talk some more Santos Festival cycling on the other end. Look at this bike. You think it's just a bike, right? But it's not. <clears throat> it's a bike. 374 people are looking at. This guy, this girl, them, all looking at it. People from here, there, and wherever this is. People that are looking for a bike or just a piece of it. Amateurs, semi-amateurs, and pro-amateurs. This guy wants this bike, but with this crank and these bars. This could be the perfect match, but not this one. This girl has a bike to sell, and thousands of people might purchase it. Eyes on bikes help grow small businesses. His, hers, yours, and the latest data and insights help those businesses keep moving. We are the world's number one bike marketplace with over 500,000 products and 900 brands, where buyers and sellers are brought together in a place where a bike is never just a bike. Bike Exchange, where the world buys, sells, learns, and rides. Life is like a two-way street. It's about consideration and mutual respect. Roads are much the same. However you get around, walk, ride, or drive, 
if we share our roads, we can all be safer. The Amy Gillett Foundation is Australia's peak cycling safety charity. Our mission is for safe cycling in Australia. Our vision is for zero cyclist deaths. Over the last year, we've seen an enormous increase in people taking up cycling, whether it be for recreation, with the family, commuting, or even to start your own cycling career. We need to do more to make it safer for every cyclist. 20 cyclists every day are hospitalized and one cyclist is killed every 10 days on Australian roads. So, the next time you jump on your bike or hop in your car, remember to practice the four C's. Be courteous, calm, considerate and conscientious. Every cyclist's death is preventable and we all deserve to get home safely. Please donate to help the Amy Gillett Foundation make the road safer for you and for me. Thanks again to Bike Exchange and the Amy Gillett Foundation. We've got a couple of live comments and questions. Uh, Amy Wang says, hi, uh, only me as an audience. <laughs> uh, and one more, that's on LinkedIn. Don't worry, Amy, we've got hundreds of thousands on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, Wendy Superfan says, hi, Dan, John, Scott. Well, Matt's gone, uh, but g'day, Wendy. <laughs> and Terry Dunn, he, this is a good idea. He says they need to do at least three laps somewhere on each stage to get people there. My friends and I will not set up the picnic table with cheese and dips and watch them go past once. If it was three, we will go. I, I like that because from a pure fan's perspective, whenever they do some sort of circuit racing, um, you know, you get an influx of, of crowd and then – you know how obviously the tour is huge. There's heaps of sponsors, heaps of budget. They do the publicity caravan. If you had a, 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 a competition or something where you had some publicity caravan and if there was like a giveaway, but one thing had a prize in it, like it could be worth 10 grand or whatever, and it just by turning up, you could win that. I know, I'd be throwing spitballing ideas like that. <laughs> yeah, but the tour and normally does – a form of that. They normally do laps. Most of the circuits and most of the stages have circuits. Sterling and all these places, Wollonga Hill, uh, the guys, I, I think... Oh, COVID, they don't want it. Well, I don't know that's the, the reason. The, the women's race is shorter and they're trying to incorporate different areas throughout Australia. I haven't spoken to Stu about that, but um, I don't know how involved he was in the actual design of, of all of the women's races either. But uh, they normally do that, and they do have uh, a little bit of a convoy going in front, you know, uh, at the Tour Down Under, uh, and throw out a little bit of uh, paraphernalia and stuff. So they actually do it very well, normally, at the Tour Down Under. Of course, much smaller budget for this event. Uh, chance to win 10 grand. That would be huge. Anyway, I'd be there. Sorry, sorry. There's a couple yeah. of things to it too. So the men's race um, are also really short stages for the NRS this week also. So it's hard to do, you know, otherwise it ends up being, you know, more like a Kermex, you know, 10, 15K, multiple, multiple laps, many, many laps. But um, And they still want to go, you know, and show as much as they can, but over shorter kilometres. So it's a bit more challenging this time. I'm sure they'll go back to doing, you know, your Sterling laps and your, you know, the Wollonga, it's not just the Wollonga Hill laps, is it? But it's the one around the beach a couple of times. So... Mm. Uh, or three laps, I think, around the beach, which is always fantastic helicopter shots, isn't it? But um, I reckon, so I, I was, I've been going in Commissaire 2 car just ahead of the race for these first couple of stages. And um, once the men's race starts, I'll be in the race, the race director's car with Stewie. And if they were doing laps and someone was, had, you know, a really lovely picnic area, that would give us an opportunity to eyeball at the first lap and then stop the second and third lap to grab a sausage or two as well for ourselves. Yeah. So I'm a big fan yep. of doing that. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Jason Cruz from the Maldives says there are some others here. So we do have a bit of a crowd tuning in. And uh, Sally agrees with Terry as well. Uh, she wants to see more laps. Now, Scooter, we, we mentioned at the start of the show, you obviously commentated with Adam Ears on the track. What were a couple of the standout performances for you? Um, well, actually, one of the guys I ride with in, uh, in the Bendigo um, we did this at the end. They asked us, to, you know, what were your highlights of the night? And, and for, for Anna, it was the farewell to Annette Edmondson. So, you know, Nettie was there and they did a big farewell and a lap of honour. So that was really nice um, to, to see that. But in the men's elimination race, it came down to Jensen Plowright, who has a, a, a fantastic reputation for having lots of desire to want to win these bunch races, right, meaning he'll go through a gap that, wasn't there and sometimes 
some people the next time you come around the following lap, the people he may have touched to get through that gap are still laying on the track. Um, so he has that kind of <laughs> reputation. Um, but it's exciting, right? So he and in this case, he wasn't actually doing anything wrong at all. He, Graham Frisley, and Blake and Yoletto. Now, Blake, young guy that's part of our Bendigo bunch, he wanted to get through a gap, you know, coming down to the last uh, three riders. And it was some real hip and shoulder and head butts. And, you know, we, we're not supposed to condone this sort of uh, riding, but gee, it was exciting to watch. Some old mm. school, you know, hip and shoulder. It was, um, and just showing to these young guys with some real spike skills and some real courage and some guts to actually have a real crack and try and win a bike race, not just sit back and, and get boxed in. So I really did enjoy that. Um, Matthew Richardson was the fastest of the sprinters and basically starts his season by just going out and riding a 9.5 flying 200 metres. Um, wow. And, and Matt Glates was only just slower than him and he'd been on the bike for two weeks after, I think, four or five months off the bike after the Tokyo Olympics. So for these guys to just pop up on the track now and do these nine and a half second flying 200s, that, that blows my mind. They are just so fast um, and it's exciting for the future of our track sprinters. What, what, what gear were they riding, do you know? Oh, exactly. I'm not sure, but they're, they're going up to crazy stuff, like 130 up to 140 inch gears, um, which is just, you know, it's just crazy, crazy. Like we wouldn't have even had the strength to get the thing one revolution, let alone, you know, <laughs> ride for a sustainable amount of time. So, yeah, it's pretty fa pretty fantastic to see. Yeah. Gavin B says, I love the idea of NRS prior to the women's and then the men's TDU. Usually go to the nationals, then wait until the following weekend before I go across to the tour down under. I'd definitely go for the two weeks. I think it's a good point. A lot of people would get behind it for sure. Yeah, and, and look, it's really only two things. The pandemic came in, so the race, the original race wasn't going to happen. And um, you had new race director with Stuart O'Grady, who was thrown in the deep end. Look, look at this. For his first two years, you know, being race director, and it's been pandemic plagued. So they've had to come up with some innovations, which has brought in the National Road Series. And Stewie's really, really on board with looking after the domestic scene. You know, he, he came through as a kid. You know, he, he would have loved doing more races as a, as a youngster in Australia before he went off to be a pro. So he sees the benefit of nurturing the grassroots. Um, and for us, like in terms of development programs, the National Road Series is a grassroots development program. Um, it's not to say it's guaranteed that it's going to happen. It still comes down to the overall budget of the event, but he certainly is, you know, looking at hoping that it can, he can keep it in. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, All right, well, the plan of attack for, you for the rest of the week, we're going to do a show on Wednesday night after the crit, yes? Yes, Wednesday, Wednesday um, we'll be doing a show. Well, we might be doing it during the crit, actually, because uh, um, after the crit, I'm uh, hosting a function. So, uh, we Well, we've seen what you're crit. like when there's chaos around. Uh, it's not the best podcasting. It is just uh, loose, but... Uh, it's What's the function, brand. John? Looser than looser than normal. Uh, yeah. it's, it's it's uh the the uh the, the bike exchange Jaco uh ladies um, um function end of end of race function yes. and being the team mascot, you need to be exactly. present at all these functions. Exactly. I've got to all get it organized. I've got Tell to I've got to, stories. I've got to find a restaurant yet. Oh no, actually I've done that. I've done that. <laughs> Have you? Um hey, just on that, because I was um listening to your interview, only the last part of it with Ruby, because I, I I came in late, but um how good is she? So, you know, I've, I get to interview her after these stages and through the National Road Series because she was so strong, you know, the last year. So I'm talking to, to Ruby a lot. She is an absolute delight, not just because she's a good rider, but she's so articulate, still mm. only young, 22, um, but she gets it. She really gets it. You know, she's not talking to me as an interviewer. She's talking to the people down the lens of the camera. Um, and, yeah, she's yeah. an absolute delight. So really do uh, wish her all the best this year for sure. Yeah, yeah definitely. Anything else you want to add, Ify, before we wrap well, things up? Well, yeah, so, uh, we're, as you say, Wednesday, and then we'll be on uh, every night after that. So we'll be doing um, uh, covering every stage of the uh, Santos Festival of Cycling. Yep. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to tomorrow's uh, final stage for, for the ladies because, you know, they've, they've really made a bike race of it. And as confident as Ruby is, they're going to have, the, the, you know, not a little big team. So they're going to have their uh, um, you, you, work yeah, cut you out Yeah, you killed her tomorrow. confidence, that, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm just trying to say this is not over yet. 
Yeah, I thought being the mascot, you'd be a little bit more supportive. But anyway, I'm barring for it. I'm barring for it. But hey, we love a bike race. We love a bike race, mate. That's right. All right. Well, uh, stay tuned. YouTube.com forward slash Detour Podcast. Uh, tick the subscribe button. Uh, get all the alerts, and we'll be live Wednesday. We don't know what time, uh, but we'll give you plenty of notice. At least five, ten minutes for sure. Exactly. Thanks for exactly. joining us again, Scotty. Good luck <laughs> for the rest hey, of the yeah, week. Mate. What were we going to oh, say before you, you, you want to go? Go, no, go, you go, Scott. Oh, I, I was going to, I was going to be. Um, uh, I know you guys. I know you in particular, Dan, interested in this, but you know because we're, I'm doing the Winter Olympics commentary coming up, right? So we know mm-hmm. that with the speed skating. Um, Steve Bradbury is going to be doing four days of the eight sessions that I'm doing. He called me today to to have a chat. So I'm like, I'm actually really excited because I'm going to be doing some work with a, an Aussie sporting legend in Steve Bradbury. So we had our first conversation today about um, about what we're going to do and. Um, yeah, and he said to he's, he said to me, being a short track speed skater, not you know the what's called speed skating, which is long track, but I don't call it long track. Um, he said, "Look, look, I'm far from an expert, you know, at, at speed skating." I said, "Mate, you know a little bit more about it than I do, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll work well together, buddy." So, look, really, really looking forward to that. Yeah. Nah, he's a ripper. I, I met him once. We did a, a little video with him, like a cartoon, talking about his career and stuff, and he was just bloody hilarious. Yeah. I remember he, he, he was guest. I think you were there, Dan. He was guest speaker yeah. at a uh, Dan Sank. Dan Sank. I was uh, there as well. Yeah, end of year one. He was he was brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah, I mentioned that, and I told him about this um because he doesn't know about the he doesn't know the names or or yet of of the 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 actual speed skaters. Um, he knows all the short track guys, and I I said, oh, there's this young kid out of America, seventeen. He is an absolute. Um, unbelievable talent, and they're talking him up like this superstar at 17, and he's you know he's their gun in the short stuff, the 500 and the thousand meters. And I said he's far, he's from Germany originally. His father's German, was a policeman, and he got them into he got he and his sister into skating by um, just clearing out the big pond in their backyard, which would freeze in winter, and then smoothing it out, and that became an ice rink. Um, and so at five years of age, that's how he got into skating. And Steve said, "Oh yeah, we did that as well. My did my dad did that for me in Brisbane." I said, "What?" So, you know, <laughs> was, obviously, it was just joking. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't think the ponds in Brisbane freeze. Yeah. Yeah, so well, they reckon it's fun. He loves plugging stuff that he's connected to as well, and I think he's launched a craft beer. And I think they're pretty strict on things that you can plug, particularly yes. to an Olympic broadcast. So yeah. <laughs> might have to have that mute button ready to go. I think he has been told by the executives at Channel 7 that that's a no-go anymore. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> looking forward to it. All right, mate. Well, we'll probably check in again throughout the week. Uh, good luck for the next couple of days, particularly. And uh, we'll check in with you, particularly, John, on Wednesday. So and you've, uh, you, you've finally broken the record. 38 the minutes short, under 40. The shortest. Yep, shortest podcast of all time. Yeah. Well, hang on. Um, There's a bit more. <laughs> <on the plug. laughs> all right, I'm pulling the plug. See you, see you Wednesday, guys. Thank you. This is the winning ride.